I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Jeffrey Cammons is the senior rabbi at Emmanuel Synagogue in Sydney. He has served at the synagogue since his ordination in 1989. Awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia in 2016, Rabbi Cammons is renowned both for his tireless work in the community, within and beyond the Emmanuel congregation, and his passion for social justice. Uh, Jeffrey, question for you to start with is uh, when you were choosing your five did you discuss them with your friends and family or did you do it alone i actually uh discussed them with my wife with uh cows you know wow. we had some and, fun and talking about them yeah excellent and, and did you have in the back of your mind given your your role uh the the thought of what your congregation might think and you think oh gosh i i, I better not choose that that's a bit racy or or whatever or actually i should have but i didn't good uh, you know i wanted to uh more be able to give you some sense of who I am as a person because for sure um, I'm a person before I'm a rabbi. Wow, well thank you, that's, that's exactly the point of, of Five of My Life, so thank you so much. Okay, so for your first choice, we're going to go to Mexico uh, to the Oscar winning modern classic Roma. So tell me about that, mate. Well, first of all, what's interesting for me is that I actually was in Mexico right at that time, in very, very briefly. And when I was 15 years old, it was kind of like my first international trip, hilarious, in Sino, where I grew up. And that's one of the things. Uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, managed to get a um, sister city in Puerto Vallarta, which was beautiful, undeveloped beachside community. And for two weeks, uh, four friends uh, and I went down there and uh, I was learning Spanish uh, from the time I was a kid. I wish I could speak it still. And so we stayed in the home. One of us was in the home of the mayor, and one of us was in the home of a town planner. And so we actually experienced the very life that one sees in Roma, which is the wealthy people, the elite of the community, and the um, you know the maids and workers that are there maintaining their lifestyle. And that they're part of the family on one level. Yes. And not part of the family on another level. And, and was the violence going on then as well? The, <laughs> the, uh, Puerto Vallarta, Sleepy Town, didn't feel what was going on and what right. was portrayed in Mexico City. But the uh, other thing that so captivated me about the movie was the whole thing that every single one of us experiences. The world's going to hell in a basket. It always feels. Uh, yes. Back then, it was, uh, you know, the the communists, the Vietnam War, uh, whatever's going to happen, the revolution in Mexico that's portrayed in uh, the uh, movie. And yet, all those things happen around you. And for the most part, we live our interior lives until it really crashes it, it, in on you. It's fascinating you say that, Jeffrey, because someone wrote in a review of that film, it, it manages to be intimate yet grand. And, exactly. and, I, and I think you, you've, you've absolutely nailed it. That, that, there's this, uh, that a friend of mine, I'll never forget, an elderly relative passed away and he was going through her things and, and he was reading her journal in 1963 and literally one of the day's entries was, JFK shot today, mum came to dinner, took dry cleaning in. 
<laughs> and you go, well, you know, there's stuff that goes on, but we've still got to pick up the dog poo and clean your teeth and whatever else. And you hope that your interior world can be strong and stable, but there are times when the world really does come crashing in. So I'm not as nervous as perhaps some, but there are signs that this time is similar to the 1930s, yes. rise of populist leaders, the use of uh, racism and hatred and bigotry to uh, maintain populist power. And how far can that game be played yep. before it implodes and violence does hit the streets and the violence that hits the streets comes knocking on your door? Sure. That's always a possibility i mean you know with the, that we see in the movie with uh you know the the scene in the in the um furniture store yeah which is true i mean i mean i, I read about that i mean i went to see it in your honor and then I, and I read all about it and gosh how you know american sponsored gangs randomly murdering students and oh dear and so, so that film one of the obviously the core themes is is sort of the inequities between you know wealthy and, and non-wealthy and you are well known for your sort of social justice work and stance is is that why you became a lawyer or is that following dad or you didn't have anything else to do or what what, what was that ironically some some of the things you said are exactly the reason i became a lawyer so i graduate uh, university in 1977 and here's the interesting thing. So I went to Stanford University, yep. which obviously is an elite university. And um, back then, you know, people would say, where well, you go to university? I'd say, oh, the barrier. You know, you never want to, you know, say these kinds of sure. things because people start to uh, pigeonhole you. But imagine this. I've been, uh, you know, excellent student, top of the class from the time of, and now graduate Stanford and come from a family where my father's a lawyer. So there are these expectations to do these kinds of things. but. When I was younger, my first interest was in politics, and then my ah, okay. favorite politicians or the people that I campaigned for were assassinated. I was actually campaigning for Bobby Kennedy at 12 years old in 1968 when he was assassinated in Los Angeles, you know, well, the hometown. And uh, uh, the, the next year, 69, campaigning for Tom Bradley at the age of 13, uh, he lost that election. Uh, first black man running for mayor, run 48% of the primary vote, and something against 13 other candidates. And uh, yet he couldn't win the final because not one of those other candidates endorsed the black man for the... Because and, he was black? And he, yeah. And, wow. the, and And as I was campaigning as a 13-year-old, I really felt the racism. And of course, Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And, um, and then I was, I still have my McGovern 72 t-shirt, um, <laughs> you know, the, to uh, say, you know, yeah. not that I was voting then, but so you have that in the background. So there kind of went politics, but I was always interested in political work. And the other thing that I've always loved is teaching. So in high school, I was a tutor for different subjects. And I, um, and, you know, after I did my stint as a lawyer and quit after one year, I was uh, teaching in high school mathematics while I was thinking of what next. So law really was, I don't know what to do. Dad's a lawyer. Yeah. Um, you know, I might as well go to law school because everybody says you can go to law school and end up doing something else. So law school. And, and, and was the reality, uh, I, I, I suspect, but I'm, I'll ask you, was the reality slightly um, uh, disappointing of actually being a lawyer rather than the concept? Well, I have to say that I wish I had this letter. I was in law school. It was the second week. Um, first of all, I so didn't really want to go to law school that after I graduated university, I deferred a year, even though I was already accepted. So, uh, and again, I went to an elite law school, which was uh, University of California, Berkeley, the Bolt Hall School of Law. So, uh, you know, where you get people who become uh, judges of high courts and uh, clerks and leading lawyers and things like that. I wrote the second week of law school a letter to my family, I remember it. It's two pages written on legal paper, lost. I don't know where it is, but I quit law school. Right. <laughs> in my head. And they said, you can't yet. I, I, <laughs> in my head, yeah. yeah. And, and I finished. Right. I, I ended up finishing. It took me four years to do three. One of those years I took off and lived yeah. on kibbutz in Israel. So I never liked law so school. So you, you and me both, which kibbutz? So I was on Gvulot, which is down south, uh, okay. right near Gaza. So right. really interesting. I was there in uh, 79 to 80. Uh, for that year, and it was such a different world. I'd had my first experience in Israel in 77, spending three months on a kibbutz after university, and uh, 
being able to uh, ride that was a different one down in that same area in Urim, and you'd ride your bike along the Gaza Strip and wave to the kids on the other side, yeah. and you could still swim over at Yamit, which was later dismantled. But it was uh, a much different world. And for a long time, I thought of being a socialist farmer, so I was bouncing in and out of law school. So doing actually that. going and living on a kibbutz? Oh, I, I, I actually, when I left after one year, and I wasn't sure what to do, I just knew... I wanted to be more secure. I knew a university education doesn't get you anywhere, really. And I wasn't sure if something weren't to unfold the right way, what I would have up my sleeve. So I went back to the States to see what might unfold. And the easiest thing to do was to pick up my student loan and go back to law school and finish. But I never liked law school. Yeah. And it was during the time I was in law school, the... Uh, Hillel, which is a Jewish student organization, educational, was across the street that I started dipping my toe into, you know, learning some Judaism. But uh, after law school, you want another story? Uh, absolutely. Okay. I'm loving uh, this. So after law school, I wanted to uh, work in the uh, Jewish community primarily. And so this is it. It's 1982. Oh, okay, okay, now I'm getting into... Um, Things that, yes, you asked about the congregation and yeah. how I'm going to talk. I'll talk the truth, <laughs> all right? Um, because this was what was so for me. And uh, there weren't a lot of jobs in uh, community work because there had been a recession, 81, 82. But there was one job going for a major Jewish organization that is about uh, defending Israel, right. um, the uh, uh, Anti-Defamation League. Had a fabulous interview. They were very impressed that this... Uh, Young, uh, what was I, 26-year-old man, having graduated from Stanford and Bolt Hall, was interested in interviewing with them. It was a fabulous interview until about maybe half hour into it, and they said something about being a spokesperson for Israel, which I was absolutely ready to do because I love Israel to this day, yeah. and I believe in our right as Jews to uh, you know, have self-determination in a, a country of our own. June 1982, war in Lebanon. It was around the time that the uh, siege of Beirut was happening. And they said, and I said something like, are you saying that I need to defend Israel right or wrong? And they said, of course. Right. And they could see something happen. I could feel something happening in my body. And obviously it showed on my face. And the uh, interview took a 180 <laughs> degree turn. We were polite <laughs> till the end. Yeah. But uh, that was it. So I ended up uh, working one year at my dad's law office. Wow. And um, when I started, I said, okay, I'll give it a year and we'll see where it goes. And uh, a year later was a Tuesday. So I ended up working to the Friday and quitting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man of my word. <laughs> now, listen, before we move on to your uh, second choice, uh, I, I am... Uh, I, I keep a journal and I write down quotes and, and things and people that interest me and just because I, I just always have done that. And, and I've, I've had one, this is going to be embarrassing, you're going to see a grown man weep, uh, that I've really liked and it's from the Talmud, but a mate said to me, no, it's not, Nigel, it's a made-up internet bit of rubbish. It's like a Hallmark card thing. So I'm going to read it to you and with your, you've got the brain the size of a small African country, you're going to tell me if it's from the Talmud or not. That's going to be very difficult because there's many volumes and thousands ah, of pages of Talmud excuses. and I certainly haven't read it all. <laughs> <laughs> of course I have. I'll, I'll try, I'll try <laughs> you out. So here we go. So, so this, this one touched me. Um, it's not my kitchen clock. Um, my kid's you know, roll their eyes. But it's, it's a clock that, um, one of those like dot matrix clocks that flips over, mm -hmm. but all it says is now. It never changed, but it changes every minute, 10 minutes, an hour. Wow. But it only but it never changes to anything other than now. Slightly oh. different typeface, anyway, blah, blah. So that like will make it. a bit Want of context. See that. Yeah. So here you go. Um, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. That's actually from. Uh, it, it's Made a, up rubbish? Uh, or no, tell me. Okay, a vote. It, it is it's not incumbent upon you to finish the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. So I can keep it. that in my journal. Yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. Now, the bits about the now added in, yeah. um, that might be uh, 
you know, a, a Instagram slight, uh, right, that's <laughs> probably a slight emendation because um, there's no Talmud, which is expanded commentary on Pirkei Avot, which is a work of the Mishnah, second century work. It's the first codification of Jewish law outside scripture, outside the Bible. And that's a very, very famous uh, and, and, teaching. And, we actually read it at uh, funerals. Okay, now we are going to stay up to date, but we're going to move from Mexico to America. You have chosen Don DeLillo's latest novel, Zero K, one of your favorite authors, I gather. He is one of my favorite authors. I love uh, the way, th- I think a lot of my favorite authors are that little bit edgy and somewhat dystopian. Um, so I love the way that he describes characters, describes relationships, and places it in a setting that for me is very evocative because they're usually set in some either America of my growing up, for example, Underworld, which is you know, just a little older than me. It begins in, you know... So Underworld like, is 1997 book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and with, you know, and it, and it covers that huge expanse working backwards in, a, in you know, the most interesting way. And uh, it, his books are the kind of books that you can read more than once. So, and so, get so you told more. me that you've reread this. Do you so, do that often? Do no. You, no. I actually reread Zero K just to have it a little fresher in my mind and knowing that I would love doing it. Yeah. The first time I read it, I was delayed on a flight coming out of Perth back to Sydney and I was you know, in the lounge for something like six or eight hours and read it from start to finish. Uh, it, it was just so uh, captivating. And, uh, and the premise of the book, yeah. which is amazing, is, is a billionaire... Um, his wife is is very very second ill. Wife. Second wife, terminally yeah. ill, and so he. Um, I'm, I'm simplifying this, but but he uh, invests lots of money and, and effort and energy into uh, cryo preservation, and his pre- preservation of body and mind in this very weird way. Yeah. So it's all fantastical on one level, but possible on another. Well, yeah. there's so many questions I want to ask you about this. So, for, so for one of the interesting things, especially to a to a religious um, mm. uh, figure, that that raises is just pretend you could do that, so that they're sort of frozen, and then the their soul ascends to heaven or whatever you believe in, and then. 20 years later, you can resurrect the person. You're resurrecting a zombie. So, in the, yeah, exactly right. But in this um, way he presents it, the mind is still there. In the, uh, uh, so weird, you know, and so you get to, it's only a few pages, kind of like in the transition from part one to part two of the book, where the second wife has been, um, you know, preserved. Yes. And so she's, they're all in these pods and cases and stuff like that. And uh, and the way he describes it is all rather um, uh, what, what should you say bizarre and mystical and her consciousness is floating and there's this sense of when your consciousness is floating and not actually in touch with your body how. Um, distressing it can actually be and uh, it opens up all kinds of confusion and one of the interesting things that is uh, in a different book but touching on this subject is in Homo Deus the sequel to Sapiens right. that, you know everybody's been uh, reading it and at the very end he's pointing out that what we have possibly um, happening for human beings is to create non-conscious intelligence and so um, Delilo's playing with you know what is consciousness itself and how does yeah. it, you know how does it manifest when it's disembodied so but, but also the, the, the for me the theme of death and how mm. badly we we deal with death and billionaires trying to uh, stave off death so larry ellison the founder of oracle is a quote here about damage death makes me very angry I mean, come on, Larry. I mean, death is, it, it's, it's a factor of like, he's invested half a billion dollars in, in halting the aging process. And, and, and for me, I'm going to come on and I'm going to ask you, because I don't know, what is the Jewish philosophy, theory, whatever, of the afterlife? So, so it, it, there's, do you know the writer Julian Barnes? Yes. A wonderful story about heaven, where heaven's a place where you go and you can have whatever you want. So the best wine, the best sex, the best anything you want. And, and, and you, you, just, you just ask for it. You want to play a round of golf and have 18 holes of one done, right? Whatever you want. Within a month, everyone presses the red button that's available, which it extinguishes yourself because nothing has any value anymore. Apart from one group. Can you guess who? I'm not, not going to try. Academics. Okay. Because they go, that you never run out of trying to... But, but the, the reason for telling that story is we... I, I think we... We kid ourselves that conquering death would be a good thing to do. 
There's a beautiful reading that we have in our uh, Maxor, which is the prayer book of uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and that whole season in uh, Judaism is about you know, facing life and death, and it happens in the seventh month of our year, which corresponds to the um, sign of Libra, and the major theme is life is in the balance, and life will end. Yes. You know, well, put it this way, life in your body will end. So this touches on your other question. So Judaism absolutely begins, and this is one of the reasons I became a rabbi, yeah. is um, in, in a, what I'll call a spiritual understanding of life, which is to say, a beyond material. Yep. So uh, I, I define an atheist as someone who only uh, believes that the material is what's real yep. and everything else doesn't exist. It's it's nothing. Whereas a, a spiritualist, uh, if you know, we'll say that is someone who believes that beyond the material is something that we'll call essential. You know, but, that, but when you cark it, if I can bring it down, it, do, do, do you go okay. on in some so way? So here's the thing. So in that, and this is, uh, so if you don't mind, it'll be a slightly longer <laughs> answer to a short question. <laughs> do you <laughs> go to heaven? Yeah. So, so um, life is what is. There is this life force. And the beauty for me in Judaism is the name that has been given God back in the Torah thousands of years ago is spelled with equivalent letters in Hebrew to uh, HVH. And that is a form in Hebrew of the verb to be. Right. And so um, there's a famous teaching and Jesus even is quoted in the um, Christian scripture saying it's the most important teaching of the Torah that basically says um, that listen up Israel, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu Nayachad. This HVH is what is our God, and it's all one. So all being is one, is the essential concept behind Judaism. And therefore, that means as a being, you are part of it, it is part of you, and while we know that our atoms will reconfigure after our death, so does our being. Now, is there any identity to being? There's Lots of speculation, but Judaism is quite clear that the afterlife is speculative. Right. It ended up developing over time a dogmatic belief in uh, resurrection of the dead, and Christianity took that and morphed it into there has been a specific resurrection of a specific person in a specific time, but Judaism's, and that influences Islam's as well, is that there is an end of time when those who are righteous, and you don't have to be a Jew to be righteous, will be resurrected. And then come all the funny questions like, in my 19-year-old body, because that was pretty buff and I was feeling really good, or is it going to be in my 93-year-old body that, you know, and I it's can going to have to be a walk? big room because there's a lot of people. And, yeah, As well, so... I have to say, I believe that life exists beyond my physical body's death, but I don't know that there will be Jeffrey Kamen's specific identity. I don't know where I heard this image, but it's one of the ones I love the most. Imagine the ocean is the ocean of consciousness, and each one of us conscious beings is a wave. Like snowflakes, there's no two waves that are alike. The wave crashes into the sand. That's the end of that wave. The water goes back to the Lovely. ocean. Right. And so it's always part of the ocean, but that specific wave identity will never exist again. So, so I, I'm therefore assuming that your notion of, of God isn't a, a white-haired bloke sitting on a cloud in a, in, in a throne. God forbid. <laughs> as my friend James Carlton would say. Um, but uh, the, the, and the other thing is that um, any incarnation of God in, is, uh, a, as God itself, I don't understand that we're all aspects or, um, you know, sparks of that divine energy or that life force. Yes. But that there's anything that is it other than it? Absolutely not. You'll always hear me use the word it when I speak right. about God as well, or you just use that word. And, and then without wanting to cause a, a schism in the Sydney community, is, is, are those views that you've just expressed um, uh, shared by, what's the opposite to progressive, to, to, the, to the non-progressive uh, yeah, so community? I, I mean, I officially identify as a traditional rabbi as opposed to an orthodox. Um, I have very progressive ideas, but I think Judaism in and of itself Absolutely. You can look at the oldest teachings of the Bible. You can look at songs that are sung in every syn synagogue around the world. And the, what is taught based on that HVH or 
basically God is, God was, God will be, God exists beyond all time and space and eternity, and God is not corporeal or divisible. We're leaving America and we're going to um, Australia because you've chosen as your song uh, the ship song by Nick Cave in 1990. Now, are you familiar with Plato's platonic forms? Not well enough. Okay, so, so I mean, I, sadly, I, I confess. See, that's so it comes back to that concept of uh, heaven, and yeah, I could learn forever and ever <laughs> and ever. <laughs> so, if, so, I but, I mean, I, I, if, any, if any scholar listens to this, they'll they'll send me a rude email. But but, it, but put simply. Uh, it's the Plato believe that everything that exists in the world is an impure copy of the perfect model that God created. So God created the perfect chair, and then there's lots of copies of chairs. God created the perfect car, the perfect man, the perfect dog, and everything is an impure copy. Now, the reason I'm saying that is Nick Cave's The Ship Song is perfect. <laughs> there is nothing you can do to make that better. You couldn't make it longer, shorter, put in a guitar solo, put in more piano. Do it. It, it's just perfect. And there are things in this life that are beautiful. I don't understand why. So I listen to that and I go, that is, I'm in the presence of greatness. I don't understand why, but I want to call my family in England and tell them I love them. I, I just don't know why, but I've just listened to, you know, say on your ships around, and I'm, I, I'm moved, I feel a little bit tearful, and, and anyway, so, so, so that, I'm so glad you chose that song, but tell me your story behind the show. Well, I love music. I wish I could play music. Uh, that would have been another dream if I could have been a musician. Ah. Are, are, you, are you a singer in the car in the shower, or? I, I, you know what? I remember as a kid being a shower singer. I remember <laughs> as a kid also being really good in the school choir, as a boy soprano, and then my voice broke, and so did all the dreams of. Uh, did you ever play in a band musician. or not? No, but my mom is a singer. Oh, ah, okay. So, and I remember, you know, walking home, and you know, and we'd be walking up the street, and we can hear her doing her, you know, scales, and then it was very embarrassing. Now it's a source of great pride that she's, you know, been a singer and a piano player and all those kinds of things. Did you go to live music a lot or not? Uh, as a, I think that's why I have tinnitus. It was, you know, too many uh, Led Zeppelin concerts and things like that. I was unfortunately just too um, young to catch uh, Hendrix and The Doors and people like that who did come through L.A. And uh, The Doors would have been, what, you know, that was, my first two albums was uh, The Doors' first album and Wheels of Fire by uh, The Cream. And so I had lots of songs that were there just for the love of music and for those lyrics and things like that. But then I thought, I want to choose something that's Australia-based because I haven't been here half my life, but it's closing in on that, which is quite a surprise to me. And Nick Cave is just amazing. He's a poet. He's, uh, you know, so incredibly dynamic and creative from his insane rock and roll things like Dig Lazarus Dig yeah. and that whole album. The, the Mercy Seat and Lazarus. Oh, man, when you really want to walk fast, you crank that up yeah. and, you know, put that in your earbuds and boy, off you go. And then he's got these most amazing love ballads and yeah. he can just so touch not just the body but the heart. And as you say... It's just the most exquisite love song. And, um, you know, there's so then, you know, once I pick it and then I start doing research, there's comments about, well, it's actually about illicit love because, <laughs> you know, um, we, you know you, you're talking about staking your moral ground. But I didn't take it like that as well. And just this morning, I was reading a commentary from him and he was saying it had to do with, you know, some of these long arguments that he was having with his wife into the night and then they'd fall into each other's arms and stuff like that and fall asleep. So for, for, for me, uh, and this... I mean, I, mean I, I just choose to believe this because it, mm. it makes me happy. But if somebody creates something beautiful and true uh, and authentic, then it exists in its own right forever. And other people's uh, responses to it are equally valid. It doesn't matter. So if Picasso or, or, or Mona Lisa or whatever it is, or a beautiful building, is your response to looking at the opera house, might be completely different to mine, and they are both equally valid because the bloke who designed it did his job. He created something beautiful. So even if, here we go, you respond to the ship song in a completely different way to how Nick 
Wanted. Wanted. Yeah. It doesn't matter because you, you, you've entered that club where you've produced something like the Sagrada Familia. Have you been to the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona? That amazing yes. church. Whoa, you go, guys, you're doing it. But, but I'm, I'm going to ask you another question and, and uh, I, I don't mean this to be a too challenging question, but I am interested. So that song, I take it, I take it to be about love and mm. it makes me feel loving. Um, do you... Um, it, how can I explain it? Is there anyone for who you just can't feel empathy? I'm going to talk about my younger sister right now because she is the most beautiful person with her empathetic heart. And there are times when I see her and I'm thinking, I wish I could be as empathetic as you. I'll tell you a story back in Encino, my hometown a few years ago. Um, my older sister, my younger sister and I were having a walk in the neighborhood. It was around, uh, um, it must have been around Christmas time, even though I don't normally go there. So uh, at then maybe it was Thanksgiving Hanukkah time because I we remember we were walking down the street and a car had uh, the back of the uh, boot had opened up and a gift fell out on the street, and they didn't know. We were maybe about 50 meters from it. Another car drove by, got out, saw it, and grabbed the bat present and drove off. <laughs> right. And my older sister and I were livid and ready to kill the person that, how can you steal a present from someone that's intended for someone? And my younger sister had empathy. So I wish I could be more empathetic. Uh, and I know there are people who can be, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still a bit more um, judgmental and intolerant of people who are just wrong and bad. I just, I can't deal with that very well. Interesting. Thank you for your honesty. Now, you mentioned Encino. So for your fourth choice, we are going to leave Australia. We're going to go back to uh, America, and in specifically, we're going to go to, it sounds like a TV program, Ballina Drive. Ballina, yeah. Ballina, okay. Now, I Google imaged that. It's pretty cool. Uh, it looks lovely. Leafy suburb, pool in the back garden, near a reservoir, next to a national park, about 10k from the ocean. Yes, it's a place I go to because my mom's still alive and my younger sister is, you know, living with her and help looking after her. So I go there three times a year. But is, is it the, the home you were brought it's up in? The, and when I go there, I am in the same bedroom that I was <laughs> in since I've been four years old. <laughs> so <laughs> it is truly a sense of home and neighborhood. When I go on those walks, I walk past the elementary school that I went from year K through six. I'm walking streets that are ingrained with, you know, thousands of layers of memory because how many we walk to school every day um and it's a bucolic neighborhood it's just uh one of those suburbs that grew up post-world war ii uh just on the other side of the city so it would be like growing up in the northern suburbs of sydney and only separated by this uh, uh mountain range as opposed to uh, a harbor and uh, you can still I go walking up in those hills. When we were kids, there were all kinds of canyons with rabbits and fox and deer. Unfortunately, they've all been uh, developed now. But still, there is the uh, state park that's about a half hour walk from our house. And then you can walk in there for, you know, hours and hours. And uh, it's absolutely beautiful up in that state park. When I was growing up, there was a live Nike missile base. Nike was the name of the missiles. So when we were kids in the 60s and you would do these drop drills as if you would, could drop under your little chair desk and survive a nuclear war, I guess that was just to make you feel good. Um, there's just, as I say, layer of memory upon memory. And all my mates are back there and my family's back there. And uh, it's a true sense of home for all the things home are coming full circle back to the movie of uh, Roma, the home that was so beautiful and peaceful and loving. And then the home that as the 60s unfolded into the 70s ended up leading to my parents getting divorced, you know. And it, it, so there's just so much there. And uh, it will be the family home forever, you know, which is a great thing. There's... Bill Bryson, the writer Bill Bryson, writes amazingly uh, about lots of things, but one of them is there was a time in American history, uh, late 60s to uh, late 50s to mid 60s, that 
probably will never be replicated. Where if you were, which I uh, imagine you are, a a, a sort of well-off professional family living in California... Life never gets better. It, it, it was at the time where, you know, the invention of the the, the the proper motor car, the drive-throughs, at McDonald's. I'm not saying those things are, are are lovely, but just if the life of a sort of professional middle class family living in uh, in Sino is pretty good. He, <laughs> he nails it. Yeah. Yeah. it, and that's we weren't upper middle class. We were middle class. We didn't, you know, have riches. The family no. holidays were, you know, get in the car and, you know, explore the the southwest, the northwest, the coast of California, those kinds of things. Sure. But it was just that beautiful life, the family together, um, a real sense of neighborhood, kids playing on the street, and uh, a, a true sense of that life that could be before the world came crashing in, yeah. which, which it did. Well, so well, I feel so lucky yeah, what a wonderful to, have, privilege. to have had that experience. And, and so I think that's part of what uh, that house and that place represents is just an incredible grounding, foundation, structure, uh, let alone it's a beautiful um, architecturally designed house in a beautiful garden, yeah. oddly with you know gum trees planted by my father in the 1960s in front of it, and who thought I'd come to the land of gum trees, you know. So there's just so much meaning to it. Wonderful. Well, so you've mentioned your mother, and uh, your fifth choice is going to um, come on to your father, because you have chosen a wonderful bronze uh, sculpture of a, to me, I'm looking at a picture of it, of a bearded man uh, reading a book. First of all, can you tell me about the sculpture, and then your story behind it? So the sculpture... It uh, was done by my dad. I don't know the year. I could look at uh, the bottom of the, uh, I think it was in the 1970s or 80s. He always was a fabulous artist. Uh, when he was a kid, we still have some of the charcoal drawings that he did, and he would tell the story. He's passed away uh, in 1998, so over 20 years ago. And uh, he uh, was doing, you know, as a kid, charcoal drawings, and then his parents saw his talent, so they sent him to a class where there was live, live uh, model, and, you know, he'd have to, um, you know, he was so shy and embarrassed, he'd kind of look up and then cover his <laughs> eyes and draw and look up and cover his <laughs> eyes and draw. <laughs> and uh, so he would tell that story, but he, so he did beautiful charcoals, and then later in life, he would have been in his 50s as he had a little bit more time because he was an incredible lawyer. He was president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, he was in, uh, renowned at the State Bar of California, and the most ethical person I've ever met, and also an atheist. So he, uh, a, a Jewish atheist. Yeah, he right. he. Um, our family, uh, his, all my grandparents were born in Chicago, and uh, then came to Los Angeles. My mom was born in L.A. My dad came there as seven, and so we were truly an assimilated family, truly secular family. I never went to synagogue uh, except for friends' bar mitzvahs as a kid. I only started learning Judaism after my time in Israel, and uh, my so my dad is an atheist, and yet the most ethical person. And that's why I have never believed that one needs religion to be good. In fact, just the opposite. If you need something written down in a book from a long time ago to tell you what's right and wrong, then you don't have a very strong inner moral development. You know, you, that should be able to come from within through the guidance that one gets from family, culture, and society, some of which is going to be influenced by those, those books and those stories. So um, my dad started doing all kinds of three-dimensional sculptures, working with clay and then into bronze. And he did a whole series of lovers and then of cowboys. And then he started doing uh, Jewish figures as well. And, I, you know, so this would uh, be, a f- and he would do them off of photographs. So this is a photograph of a, uh, a rabbi who was studying a, ah. a, a Jewish text. And so part of it is just the irony that, you know, then I became a rabbi and can you imagine I had to quit working in my father's <laughs> law office, <laughs> not knowing what I was going to do. So I'm now like, you know, what was I was 27, almost 28, clueless as to what was I was going to do in life. And then having to tell him that I was going to become a rabbi yeah. <laughs> because I'd had that moment of revelation that that was the way of being able to 
you know, work in community, which is something that I'd always wanted to do is to transform community and society, but now to do it, not as a politician, but to take all my spiritual drive. Cause unlike my father, I always had a sense, even in that bedroom in Encino as a little kid, that there was a presence beyond this material world. I deeply sensed it and I felt it more than once, not as often as I would like. And uh, I've always had to be true, though, that the kind of rabbi will be is one that my father would respect. And uh, that is, therefore, to be as non-judgmental as possible and as, you know, guiding on a moral path. Jeffrey, that's, that's really wonderful to hear you tell that story, is uh, talk a little bit about your relationship with your dad, both as, as the, the, the father-child relationship, but also as a grown, successful <laughs> rabbi and and a grown ex-lawyer atheist with a rabbi, his son. Uh, you know, the area you described, as kids, we idolized our dad, right? And he was an incredible teacher. He would look over our homework at night when, you know, with the red pen and teach us how to write better and think better. And uh, he also... Uh, with my mom exposed us, you know, to the world beyond our house. We he did everything in the garden with my mom, and so uh, Sundays were days where we would either be out in the garden pulling weeds or picking up the worms from the lawn or the snails or whatever, or um, we would take the car down to the beach and uh, you know just or go up into the hills and have hikes. So he you know introduced us to nature and things like that. He was also incredibly family oriented. Uh, he worked hard, 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 long hours. Every Saturday, he would go into the office. And so uh, many a Saturday morning, I would go with him and read a book in the office because afterwards we'd go over to visit his mom, uh, my grandmother. And so we, we learned what it is to respect family, to know, to respect elders. And he just imparted so many deep, deep lessons to us. But then, like everyone else, you know, it's the late 60s, it's the early 70s. And the questioning authority, and that's just natural as a teenage boy and the only boy in the family, um, you know, challenging my father. And it got, and I, um, I think I relate to teenagers very well because I had, you know, some uh, turgid and uh, turbulent, uh, you know, teen years. Uh, there was some. Are you saying you went off the rails, Jeffrey? Not, well, probably more emotion. My marks were always at the top of the class. But emotionally, yes, you know, and there perhaps I could have been guided more differently, but I don't think my mom and dad had those skills then. And also, I mean, the late sixties and seventies was just, it was a revolutionary time. Everything just, you know, hit the fan, so to speak. And it took a long time to find equilibrium. And my parents did get divorced in that time. And, um, and that created complications in relationship. But I have to say, by the time I was in my 20s um, and uh, done with law school and it was working with him, uh, incredibly close relationship and uh, incredibly deep and loving and respectful. Yeah, and, and He taught me the most important lessons in life. He sounds an amazing man. And, and uh, 98 sounds a bit... A bit he was early, young. yeah. Was Fought in World War II, decorated soldier, silver star and bronze star, um, and uh, never a scratch. Came out, worked as a lawyer, never sick a day in his life, and then just toward retirement, developed some blood condition that the treatment was a little bit of a form of chemotherapy. I didn't realize that had a risk factor of uh, bringing on leukemia, and mm. one day it did, and six weeks later he was gone. And so, um, and you it, were over here by then. I, I was uh, back and forth. Uh, I, I I was here at that time, yeah. And uh, I thank God I uh, was able to be there the last week of his life. But and that's always and that's the hardest thing of being an expat is being mm. away I, from I family. And uh, you know, I have a beautiful wife here, and the family that she's created is you know family here. But it's you know not the same as the family into which you were born. And, uh, you know, the, the family that I have from my first relationship as well is also dear to me, and they're all over there. I, I would like to make this conversation ten times longer, because you, uh, you have brought your real sense, uh, a real sense of yourself in today, and that's a real privilege, so thank you. Uh, I've got a couple more questions for you. Is, one is, 
You are quite a, if I can coin a phrase, you're quite a private public person, if that makes sense. So you have a public role, uh, but you... But, you know, when I was researching you and investigating you, um, you, you don't parade personal stuff, which I, I find quite an attractive quality. Um, but uh, I have a question for you. As a private public figure, is there something that you wish people understood about you? No, I think uh, I'm fine with keeping private private, and that's why I don't have any social media profile. I also don't have the time for it, but I really don't have the desire other than it would be interesting to find people that I knew when I was 15 or something like that. But if it's meant to happen, it will happen. I think one of the things is is that my voice as a rabbi, uh, because I speak about issues that I think are deeply human, deeply Jewish, and deeply crucial to the life force, People think I'm political because everything has a political ramification. So I speak about the environment. I, I explained how I've been so connected from the time my you know, mom and dad took us on all these nature trips and grew our garden and climate change. And then it becomes a political issue, which it should not be. So you're not approaching it from the political angle. You just go, this is what I believe, and you can make your own... It's a bit like the, the work of art that we're talking about. You, you go, th- th- these are the things I believe, and if you think that means this politically or that politically, up to you. The only difference with the work of art is um, that... I, and so, you, Nick Cave song. I find it absolutely powerful, beautiful, as you do, or you know, any of the other music. So, But that is the subjective world. And, you know, as I say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and the meaning will be in the eye of the beholder as well. But there is an objective world. You know, in other words, there really is uh, uh, something known as gravity, as uh, Harari points out in his book, Sapiens, you know, Marie Curie, you know, she might not have believed in radioactivity, but it killed her. You know, you're going to get cancer if you expose yourself. And, you know, I have this pen sitting next to me. Sorry about the clink, but I'm going to drop it. Yeah. And it fell, you know, even if I didn't believe in gravity, Gra- you know, there's certain things in the objective world. The, and so the question is, is climate denigration in the warming planet, something that's objective or subjective. I personally believe that there is objective evidence that the climate is warming. How one responds to that is the question that is challenging. And the real thing is, is that we live in an intersubjective world. So what we need to do is take objective data and then try to say, so what are basic assumptions behind the world in which we live. And let's find, uh, you know, through conversation, the best we can, what are our shared values, assumptions, and goals and visions so that we can create the world we want to live in because it isn't an accident, the world in which we live. It's a world in which there is purpose and we create purpose and meaning. And there's only one of them. So if we trash this one, it's not going to look good for your great grandkids. Exactly, exactly. And again, we're not going to solve the refugee crisis, but especially as Jews, I feel like we need to have deep compassion and empathy for people. I was blessed to be born in Encino in the, you know, 19, late 50s and grow up there in the 60s. But how about the people who aren't so blessed? How can we not have compassion for them and try to help resolve that situation and do what is our duty according both to the United Nations conventions we signed, but also what it is to be an empathic human being? Well, I'll tell you, so I, I mean, just very quickly, I, I studied theology at university. Oh, great. And, um, uh, I mean, I've, I've always been interested in that side of life. Uh, if you have a faith and you are observant in, in whatever tradition, and it doesn't lead to compassionate works, I, I just put my hand up and go, I'm officially confused. You can take your faith and your observance. So, so just pretend you go to, I mean, I'm at randomly Catholic mass every morning. Right? Uh, so that you, you're ticking the box, you could not be more observant, but you're horrible to your husband, and you never do anything to help the community you live in. You go, well... That, that doesn't get you a free pass. I mean, I, I mean, I'd rather, like your dad, you're an atheist, but you're the most ethical man you've ever met. I, I don't agree want with you more. to end this conversation, but I'm going to end it with the six traditional closing question. Who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? I should have remembered that was coming. <laughs> Barack Obama. Done. Mate, thank you so much. Thank you. 
The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. Listener.